Hi. I'm uh, Kevin Stoda, and this is the Kevin Stoda Channel. We're going to be reading today this wonderful, wonderful article by Ruth Reichel. Uh, I don't know if she says her name that way. That was the German way. Ruth Reichel. <laughs> uh, it's called The Changing American Table. And, of course, it refers to what we eat at our meals. A table is what we refer to as a place to eat. All right, and they've got a lot of nice pictures here for this story. We've got um, food from the 50s, 60s, and all the inventions that came after World War II. Uh, the articles uh, about food is relatively cheap and plentiful these days, but ask the writer, is it, is it as tasty and healthy as it was 60 years ago when she was growing up? The answer will be no. So the title is How We Eat. Uh, we had back then family farms, and now we have super fast everything and ultra meals, you name it. But in the meantime, early in her life, she experienced a lot of these changes. So I'll, it's a great history. So for historians and for uh, nutritionists and for people who want to be healthier, we need to think about how we want to change our food system uh, and that for our children. Uh, this is a wonderful piece. It's in the AARP magazine, uh, the one with... Um, Kevin Costner on front. I'm Kevin Stoda, and this is the Kevin Stoda Channel. Ruth r writes, I've been writing about food for 50 years, um, yet it took the COVID-19 crisis to show me just how much I didn't know. Facing empty supermarket shelves for the first time in my life, I reached out to the people who keep us fed. As I spoke with farmers, uh, fishermen, ranchers, chefs, and ch cheese makers, I finally began to understand how our food system really works. Here's the thing. We are all aware that our food tastes have changed. We have, we know that America now eats more uh, salsa than ketchup, and that ramen is familiar to people as Campbell's soup, tomato soup was in the old days. Still, when it comes to the basics, we tend to believe that we're eating pretty much the same food that our grandparents did. Mm-mm. Consider Thanksgiving dinner. Since 1863, when Abraham Lincoln declared Thanksgiving a national holiday, Americans everywhere have been sitting down to roast turkey, stuffing, and mashed potatoes. This tastes just like my grandmother's, my husband says every year, as we revel in the fact that we are literally eating history. His memory is playing tricks on him, though. The food on my family table and yours does not resemble in any way what our ancestors once ate. A turkey hatched 50 years ago would look very suspiciously at the bird you're carving up today. The farmer of the past would barely recognize the potatoes on your plate and the wheat in the bread we use for stuffing is nothing like the amber grains on the plains of the past. American food is being transformed as such a rap at such a rapid pace uh, a few years ago, uh, excuse me, a few years from now, it's entirely possible our turkeys will no longer even be hatched from eggs. Although I may not re remember my grandma's food and how it tasted exactly, I certainly remember her complaining about its cost. Little wonder, as almost a third of her household budget went to feed the family. That was around World War II. Since then, Food prices have come down so dramatically that the average American spends a mere 7% of their budget on it, less than people spend in any other nation on earth. That seems like progress, but just look at us. Three quarters of us in America are overweight and six of 10 of us suffer from chronic uh, illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, asthma, and hepatitis. Does your cheap food have anything to do with that? Look for your answers. Turn back the clock. And Ruth Reichel goes on to add, When I was growing up in Connecticut, my mother bought corn poultry and tomatoes from the farm next door. Our milk came from the Loudoun uh, Dairy Farm down the road. The farm is long gone and the dairy is now a golf course. But I never gave much thought to why they disappeared. It was not, it turns out, an accident. As we entered World War II, Two, almost a quarter of Americans were employed in farming. Okay, about 25%. After the war ended, the Cold War began. Our government decided that growing bigger, better, and sustainable, 
substantially, excuse me, more food than the Soviets did would be a great way to speed democracy in the United States and around the world. They began by converting into fertilizer the enormous stockpile of ammonium nitrate left over from the explosives program. Now you get a connection between our militarized economy and our world. The new nitrate-rich fertilizer dramatically increased productivity. Meanwhile, new labor-saving machines replaced inefficient horses and progressive plant breeding improved yields. Scientific advances uh, such as the use of antibiotics to make animals grow um, faster were also introduced. By 1960, our farms had become so efficient that fewer farmers were able to grow significantly more food. And farmers dwindled in the 60s to about 9% of the population. Small farms were gobbled up by bigger ones, and in suburban America, farms began to vanish. Urban dwellers barely noticed, but we were starting to lose touch with the way our food was grown. Things got so bad that 10 years ago, when I handed a cucumber to a New York City kid, he looked at it with wonder and said, what's that? But we weren't losing just farms. My family used to pile into dad's old woody uh, station wagon every summer, stopping to eat at local restaurants as we drove across the country. I remember my first taste of Rhode Island stuffies and the thrill of Iowa loose meat sandwiches. I don't know what those are. Do you? Uh, but she did. As we drove to South Carolina, I repeated the words, Frogmore stew, Frogmore stew, over and over, wondering what that regional specialty would taste like. Those trips ended in the 60s. Restaurants that served those dishes began to close, and road trips were a lot less fun when the only dining places left were fast food. Americans had chosen consistency over tradition, yet we lost more than regional flavors at that time. We lost some of the glue that held rural America together. Efficiency also invaded our homes. Uh, in the early 50s, Poppy Cannon's The Can Opener Cookbook charged uh, onto the bestseller list with its suggestions for fast, easily family meals. When mom be became a fan of this, dad and I began to dread dinner. I recently looked up the recipe for one of her favorite dishes, which was called casserole a la king. It turns out to be canned macaroni and cheese mixed with canned chicken a la king and topped with grated cheese, breadcrumbs, and butter. Did mom really think it was palatable? Did anyone? I expect that much of Poppy's success was due to her promoting her specious theories on America's favorite new medium, the television. Remember, television trays came out about that time. Um... But she was just a sign of the times. By the 1950s, most American kitchens were equipped with refrigerators and housewives filled their new freezers with three iconic foods of that time. There were TV dinners, uh, fish sticks, and tater tots. Frankly, after uh, Poppy Cannon's concoctions, they were a little bit better. You know, I imagine so too. They were a thrill. Those chicken TV dinners with their peas and mashed potatoes were some of the best meals mom ever made. So not all moms are good cooks. What we want is to make life more easy for our housewives. That's what Vice President Richard Nixon told Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in the famous kitchen debates of 1959. My mother and legions of other women held Nixon to his word. For them, even tin dinners took too much time. Instant became my mother's favorite word as she happily embraced an entirely new group of foods designed to get her out of the kitchen quickly. Instant mashed potatoes, freeze-dried instant coffee, Pop-Tarts, Tang, and of course, Carnation Instant Breakfast began to line our cupboard shelves. Mom bragged she could get dinner on the table in 15 minutes flat. Some people had second thoughts about all this. The price of air travel had dropped dramatically and hordes of American tourists went off to explore Europe and other parts of the world on $5 a day. They came home hungry for the delicious foods they tasted on their travels. Julia Child was there to help. This book she wrote in the introduction to Mastering the Art of French Cooking, first published in 1961, is for the American cook who can be unconcerned with budgets, waistlines, or anything which might interfere with the enjoyment of producing something wonderful to eat. On the other hand, the 1960s were a decade of enormous culinary conflict. 
Women entering the workforce in record numbers yearn for e ever faster and easier ways to prepare their families. Meals. Um, frozen bread dough, um, frozen pie crust, green peas, and cool whip all entered the market to make their lives easier. And if there was a little, uh, if there, they were a little late getting home from work, that problem was easily solved. Snack food options were exploding with the introduction of Pringles, Ruffles, Bugles, Cheapos, and Doritos. I think Pringles really didn't come out to the 70s, did they? The Julia Child crowd, however, had a new friend in the White House in the 60s. Eleanor Roosevelt had served hot dogs to the King of England. Mamie Eisenhower once plied the King of Greece with toasted Triscuits. But the new First Lady was eager to show off a different side of America. Jackie Kennedy lured a chef from France, Rene Verdon, to Washington so she could regale the president's guests with Canelles and Sol Veronique, two recipes straight from Julia's, uh, Julie's cookbook, Julia Child, that is. Um, long before anyone had heard of farm-to-table cooking, Verdon was growing vegetables on the White House roof and herbs in the East Garden. Perhaps that inspired Howard Johnson to hire an equally accomplished French chef to upgrade the food at his iconic chain of American restaurants. Jacques Pepin is one of the American's unsung heroes. At Har Howard Johnson's, Jacques went back to the basics, making everything from scratch. He understood that American food could be. His kitchens turned out 10 tons of fresh hot dogs daily, and he insisted on real potatoes in the clam charter and real clams in the fried strips. To this day, if you ask me to define American food, the first thing that comes to my mind are memories of those crisp, delicious fried clams there at Howard Johnson. Uh, again, Ruth reichel has got this history. She's kind of going over it with the foods here. We've got Campbell's Soup in 1934. We've got uh, Tater Tots in 1953. And we've got uh, all kinds of other things popping up in the years after that. You see the tank coming up in the 60s. It was designed for space, flying into space uh, for our astronauts and, and the Pop-Tarts and the bacon, shaking bacon and all kinds of goodies. And up through the 70s, we've got um, uh, not just frozen pumpkin pie, but we've got crock pots uh, and wine that has uh, caps that you just twist off and that sort of thing. Uh, all kinds of things that you remember growing up and learning about as an American. Uh, my wife is from Philippines. She does not know what a crock pot does. She does not work with it. I've tried. <laughs> I'd like her to try, but she doesn't. Okay, let's get this straight. Um, another thing happened in the 1960s that shook up our ideas about food. Congress revamped immigration policy and that opened the doors to chefs from all over the world to come to the United States. Uh, um, I will never forget my first taste of Thai cooking. Initially, my head exploded, then tears ran down my face, and then I wanted more uh, and more. The new flavors from China were also shocked. For the first time, cooks from provinces other than Canton entered the country and we all discovered Sichuan and Hunan food. Is it any wonder that we embarked on a spicy food craze from which we have yet to recover. Last year, Americans spent $700 million just on hot sauce. Even so, when I wrote my first cookbook in 1971 and included a recipe for a Chinese chicken dish I'd learned from a chef in Manhattan's Chinatown, my editor was horrified. Will people really want to cook that, she asked. She was equally wary of Greek moussaka I'd brought back from a trip abroad. Americans, she insisted, did not like that sort of stuff. They just wanted a cookbook to make desserts. Couldn't I use lamb substitute on that moussaka? I like beef. Uh, bacon uh, was what the people wanted at that time from cookbook writers. Perhaps that's why Americans were going so fat, though, focusing on desserts. In 1950, about 10% of Americans were overweight or obese. Only 10%. That percentage jumped to 44% by the 60s and some 72% today, and I'm an example of that. What about you? Along came Weight Watchers. By the time uh, Jean Nedich published the first Weight Watchers cookbook in 1966, a million and a half copies flew off the shelves. And yet, 
Though Weight Watchers has been joined by dozens of other diet systems in the intervening years, we have not stopped growing and growing. Like everyone who writes about food, I have produced dozens of articles on the subject. Uh, we should stop drinking. We should stop eating carbohydrates. We should exercise more. All good advice, but probably beside the point. The real answer, I think, is start staring us in the face. Eating is learned behavior, and from the moment our children are born, we begin teaching them that the most delicious foods are filled with fat, sugar, and salt. That may be true even in the Philippines. Uh, so I'm not sure that's all that explanatory. It's what they add to those substances, I think. Back, or it's the volume. Back in the 60s, a young writer named uh, Nora Ephron took a worried look at the schizophrenic America diet and wondered which way it would go. Whatever happens, she wrote in 1968, the food establishment at this moment has the power to change the way America eats. And in fact, about all it is doing is showing how to make a better pie crust and fill a bigger bread box. She had a point. Those in the food press were so busy discovering new cuisines, so involved with re recipe writing and restaurant reviews that they paid scant attention to what was really happening to our food. It wasn't good. And that's when the disaster happened. Nick, Nixon's Secretary of State, Earl, uh, excuse me, Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, I remember him. I grew up in Kansas in the 70s and farmers hated him, was determined to make food even cheaper for Americans. It was the Cold War on steroids as he urged farmers to get big or get out of the business. The result was the demise of even more small farms and the rise of ever larger and more efficient factory farms. These events all came at a cost, including to flavor. One day in the 70s, I boarded a plane while carrying a flat heirloom set a group of strawberries from a small California farmer. The effect was electric. The perfume of those aromatic berries filled the plane, and one, of, one by one, people rose from their seats to beg for a taste. Oh, crooned one woman, closely uh, closing her eyes as she looked in ecstasy across her face. I'd forgotten what real strawberries used to taste like. That was the 70s. So I've not really grown up in real strawberry time. I remember what real uh, um, from that would be raspberries were, but they were super. Uh, we'd all forgotten. Yes, strawberries, corn, tomatoes, and peaches in our supermarkets were big now. They were beautiful. They lasted a long time too. The meats were plentiful. It's just that none of it tasted like much anymore. At least not like it did. Some people also began to wonder if the new foods were as nutritious as they once had been. And what about, um, let me turn the page, those animals that were being raised in cages. These issues were raised in 1971. Francis Moore LaPace published uh, his uh, Diet for a Small Planet, which proved to be a wake-up call for millions of young people, including me pointing out that raising meat is an extremely inefficient way to produce calories. She urged her readers to get their protein by combining grains and legumes. We were all very earnest, and as Anna Thomas's The Vegetarian Epicure appeared, followed by Molly Katzen's Moosewood Cookbook, and William Shirtliff and Akiko Aoyagi's The Book of Tofu, a lot of us started down the path of vegetarianism. You might call the 70s the granola decade, Farmers' markets were open for the first time in, in decades. Soda bottles began to be recycled, and counterculture foods such as uh, Celestial Season herbal teas and Yoplait yogurt appeared on our supermarket shelves, followed by Ben & Jerry's opening their first store. Then the food scare started. In the 1980s, when I became the food editor of the Los Angeles Times, the newspaper's lawyers insisted we put warnings on all recipes featuring undercooked or raw eggs. The American egg supply was so badly contaminated by salmonella that we were advised in our readers to avoid soft boiled eggs. The term salmonella, botulism, and mad cow disease entered our vocabulary at that time. We were accustomed to being cautious about what we ate when we went abroad, but few of my generation had ever worried before about the safety of American food. It was a shock, though temporary. In 1993, Reese Schoenfeld had an idea to change the way we thought about food. A television channel devoted exclusively to what we eat. TV's Food Network started on a shoestring budget, but within 15 years had become a juggernaut 
that changed America's ideas about food and cooking and made the chefs the coolest people on the planet. Viewers wanted to taste new foods, travel to new places, and cook. Cooking once relegated to the women's pages of a newspaper had finally broken free. I don't think it is impossible or possible to overstate the positive influence of food television. It may have begun with silly shows such as the kitschy Japanese Iron Chef and with Emeril Lagasse shouting BAM, but it paved the way for the enormous range of programs that have become part of popular American culture. Most important, thoughtful cooks like Anthony Bourdain inspired a generation to look at food in a way America never had. For the first time in our history, we are starting to understand that how and what we eat have consequences far beyond the table. Uh, people who care about the environment, for instance, have driven the cause of organic farms whose numbers have doubled in the past 10 years. Old time farmers had it right. Plants grown in fertile soil are not only more traditious, uh, nutritious, they also require less water. Major companies such as General Mills and Nestle's are starting to put millions into regenerative agriculture and that is cause for rejoicing. But the most revolutionary change in food production revolves around meat. Research, research has shown that a meat-based diet increases the risk of heart disease and cancer. And environmentalists worry about the vast amount of water it takes to produce a pound of beef, mostly to grow food for the cattle. Bring on the plant-based burgers, they say. They're everywhere now, and meat, egg, and fish alternatives are showing up on our menus across the country. Though note, many of those alternatives rely on genetically modified beans and grains along with a range of unpronounceable chemicals. Warning. The coronavirus disruption that we're facing now uh, has shown problems with the American food supply chain, and it changed the way I shop, cook, and eat. Seeing packing plants turned into COVID-19 hot spots made me question how we process our meat. I think we should all demand a different way that meat be processed in the United States. If they want to export it, I don't care, but I think we need to set an example home, at home of how to process meat safely and even if it costs a little bit more and we need to change the system of farming altogether. Watching the domino effects of the restaurants being shut down, dairies having to dump milk, fishermen who lost so much business that they simply docked their boats, has inspired me and many other Americans to spend in ways that could more directly benefit our food suppliers and producers. Indeed, across the country, people in lockdown began to cook again, and the family meal long threatened returned in earnest. Many who had never before put their hands into the dirt-planted gardens, uh, seed sales have soared. Now, people like me who live in rural parts of the country began buying our food straight from the farm, just like my mother once did. I know I'll be doing that for the rest of my life. And there's another reason to be hopeful. As Nixon told Khrushchev in 1959, the American system is designed to take advantage of new inventions and new techniques. For most of our lifetime, that technology was used to give us cheaper food. But we're finally beginning to understand the hidden costs and far-reaching consequences of those inventions. And there's no reason to believe that new technology will not bring us food that is increasingly healthy uh, and nutritious and flavorful. If there is anything to be learned from the history of American food, it is that we are capable of enormous changes at the drop of a fork. Um, again, this wonderful writing and about the history of uh, American food since World War II and our situation today is by Ruth Reichel. Uh, she's a cookbook author and was the restaurant critic for the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times and was the editor-in-chief of the Gourmet Magazine. Her latest memoir is Save Me the Plums, 2019. Yeah, I just had some uh, tomatoes from our garden and of course you can tell the difference. And these are older seeds that you don't uh, uh, necessarily see on the supermarket shelves, types of uh, tomatoes. So um, I recommend you guys uh, get out and garden. I'll show you a little bit of what my wife has done in the front yard here. Just to give you a little look here. So our front yard has uh, tomatoes growing in it where maybe other people would have flower beds. And over there along the fence, we've got more. And there's cucumbers up there. 
and uh, for next year we got some strawberries they're not doing too well this year but uh, they're the first year and I think strawberries grow better in the second year anyway anyway so thank you for watching uh, the Kevin Soda channel this is Kevin Soda on the porch at the porch and uh, thank you for learning about American food